Welcome everyone to this session on speech enabling apps for Windows Phone 8. My name is Avery Bishop and uh, the F is silent, so just call me Avery. I've been at Microsoft for almost 12 years working on language support in general and for the past few years in uh, the speech group. And I'm currently in the speech platform group and worked uh, on this, uh, this feature that we're going to talk about today. I also have a couple of my colleagues here, Jay and Rob, who has stage fright, so he's sitting in the back there. <laughs> and they, they may jump in with some color from time to time. Um, before I get started into the presentation itself, I'm going to do something a little unusual. I'm going to do the demo first. So those people who are late, <coughs> you can tell them about it, how cool it was. Uh, and there's a reason for that, and you'll see what that is. I've got a Windows Phone 8 device here. It's actually a test device and it ha has had problems. So if the demo gods are smiling on me, everything will go fine. Ooh. Text Jay Waltmanson. Texting Jay Waltmanson. Say your message. Hey Jay, where are you? Hey, where are you? You can say send, add more, or try again. Send. Now, notice what happened there. That's th th that is a first party app, a built in app, that was available on Windows 7.5. You were able to launch the app and give it a command and have it carry out that command. And then when you got into the app itself, you were able to carry on a dialogue with, with the application you were able to speak to it and, and get notification back and, and confirmation, all by just that one press on the button. I personally find this really helpful because I, I, I need reading glasses to, to, to see the, the keyboard and, and, and my fat fingers fumble around when I try to use the, the soft key, keypad. So that's one thing. Now, let's take another look and we're going to do something a little different. I'm, gonna, I'm going to show how those speech features that were available in Windows 7.5 are now available to you as developers in Windows Phone 8 and you'll be able to incorporate them in your applications as well and be part of the overall speech experience. So let's take a look at that. This, this is a really simple demo application that I've written. It doesn't have a lot of functionality but it does illustrate the concept. Magic memo. Enter a new memo. Entering a new memo. Say your memo. Check out the new Windows Phone devices. Heard you say check out the new Windows Phone devices. Say a button name, quit, save, and try again or try again. View saved memos. Heard you say view saved memos. So there. Again, I was able to launch the application, give it a command, and then carry on a, a dialogue with the application using speech recognition and text-to-speech for feedback and, and confirmation. And that was in an application. And you will be able to do the same thing and integrate your application as part of the overall phone experience. So with that, let's launch into the presentation itself and see how all that's done. So this is, the, this is what we'll be talking about today. Uh, I'm going to introduce the new features briefly, and then I'm going to talk about those scenarios to give you an idea of what scenarios you can support for your users. Then we'll go into detail about those two specific scenarios, launching an application and giving it a command with one utterance, and then once you're in the application, carrying on a dialogue with the user. I, I'm going to ask you, to, by the way, to hold questions to the end, please, for a couple of reasons. One, because we have a lot of material to cover. And I, I love to hear your questions. I love the dialogue with, you, with uh, developers. But I think we're going to cover some of your questions during the presentation itself. And so it'll save a little time if you wait to the end. So here are the new two features for Windows 8. I, as we saw in those two demos, the, the, the first scenario that we support is launching an application and giving it a command in one utterance. 
the user, your users will be able to, when, from anywhere in the phone, say, launch whatever your application name is. No, they don't have to say launch, excuse me. They just say the application name and, and a command, and it will launch that application and carry out the command. And then when they're in the application, they'll be able to carry on a dialogue. You'll be able to prompt them to say things, give them command names, and, and so on. And they can speak and then get notification and confirmation back. So let's look at those scenarios, as I mentioned. It's a good idea to think in terms of the scenarios that your users are going to use. We like to do this because we like to think of, uh, of developing software from a user-centric point of view as opposed to we as developers just liking to ha wa wa wanting to have a good time uh, writing cool code. You, have, you need to think of your, developer, your, your, excuse me, your users first. And I'm sure you're all aware of this. So the first scenario, again, based on that simple sample application that I wrote, we have this persona named Mandy. She wants to display a memo that she already has entered into her magic memo application. Without speech, she has to find the application, wherever it is, punch on the, on the application button, go to the right page, scroll up and find the memo, and finally after three or four uh, frustrating uh, minutes, maybe minutes or seconds, whatever, she finally finds that memo that she wanted to display. However, with speech, all she has to do is push the button and say, magic memo, show memo number three. It comes up immediately. So that's the scenario that we're enabling with this voice command feature that we'll talk about in, in detail here. And the second scenario is, as I mentioned, once you're in the application, you can carry on a speech dialogue with, with the application. Your users can speak to the phone and get notification and confirmation back and then speak again and so on. So here's, in this case, Mandy now, she's in her, the application, she wants to enter a new memo. So without speech enabled, what she has to do is go to that text box, tap on it, get the soft keypad up, and uh, fumble around with the keys and finally get something and then save it, make sure it's right, and so on. As I said, with my tired old eyes I find, and my fat fingers, I find that difficult. You guys are younger than I am, so maybe it's easier for you. Uh, but once Mandy has speech on her phone and has this, uh, this speech-enabled magic memo application, all she has to do is tap that microphone and say, and, and get the notification, enter your memo. She says the memo. She says save or, or try again. And she's able to enter several memos in a row with just that one tap on the microphone. Again, with, through this speech dialogue, with, with the application. And you will be able to do this same thing in your applications. So now that we've looked at the scenarios and the, and the, the basics, let's uh, look at it. first an overview of voice commands, that first scenario. As I said, anywhere on the phone, you don't have to be in the application. You don't have to be on, on the home screen. You can be in, in some other application as well. You simply say the name of the application and a command that it recognizes. And you, as the, your code will get a notification that it's been launched via voice commands, and you can use that information to execute the command the right way. And there's also a built-in user interface that integrates with the whole speech user interface of the phone. So your application looks like it's part of the phone. It's, it's part of the speech experience of the phone. It's not a foreign object. And your users, I think, will really appreciate that. So the way you do it is you specify the commands that your application is able to, to handle, to listen for, in a thing called a voice command definition file. And we'll go into that in a lot of detail. Uh, it allows dynamic parameter lists. So you can, you can change the phrases that it listens for over time, depending on things like uh, maybe you have a list of favorites or using geolocation to determine the restaurants in the area or whatever. You can, you, you can change the the, some of the parameters in the commands that you listen for. Uh, it, the voice command definition file will accept multi commands in multiple languages, and we'll, we'll deep dive into that and show how that's done. Uh, the, and again, I'll, I'll 
go into this in a little more de detail later on, but there's, and there's code for how you do all these things, initialize your, your VCD on first run, and how you dynamically update your parameters. So there are f basically four steps for enabling voice commands on your, on your phone, in your application. The first is you specify the voice command definition file that I mentioned, which is to say you, you give the, all those commands that you're able to handle in your application. Second, you register that VCD file. You have to do that once. Generally, you do it on first run, but you can do it any time that's convenient. And then when your application has been launched by voice commands, you detect the fact that it was launched by voice commands, and you act accordingly. Note what that command is and, and execute that command to uh, satisfy your user. And if you have phrase lists or what they're, they're, these are sort of parameter slots, if you have those and they're changing dynamically, then you'll want to uh, update them as they change. Again, this is optional. It depends on how your application is set up. So here's a, a sample voice command definition file. There's a lot going on here, and so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. Um, the first thing you'll notice is that there, the highest level element is what's called a command set element. A command set contains all of the commands that you're able to handle in your application for a particular language. You can have one command set per language. I have two here. I have an English one and then a, uh, an English command set and then a sort of a dummy Japanese command set. I had, wasn't able to fill that in because of space constraints. Uh, the next thing you'll notice is that there's a, a thing called a command prefix. Think of this as an alias for your application. We provide this because a lot of apps have uh, sort of these cool names that have uh, non-pronounceable characters like exclamation points and dollar signs and things like that. Or we can't recognize those with, with the speech recognizer. So we need something that we can actually recognize. So we, we ask you in that case to, to give a, a name that's that's a subset of your app name or is very similar sounding, so it's intuitive to the user. The other thing is you'll want to avoid uh, uh, command set name, excuse me, uh, command prefix that is anything phonetically like the built-in commands like call and find and that sort of thing because we don't allow those for obvious reasons. It's, it's, that's, that would be a real inconvenience to the users. Next. Notice there, there are two examples here. There's this example under the command prefix, and then there's also a an example under the first command. And these play slightly different roles. The first example is a sort of, sort of a global example, and I'll show how that shows up in the, in the overall speech UI here in a minute. And the second example is specific to that particular command. And again, that's also something that we, we, uh, we highlight when we display your app, and, and we'll see examples of that. Within the command element, you can have several listen for elements, and these are just different ways to say that command. In this case, it's very simple. The, the idea of this command is to show a particular memo. So one of the ways to, to, for the user to say that is show memo number whatever and there's a slot there that can be filled in by some number that comes from this list down below. So those curly braces, they are a reference to what we call a phrase list, and you can have, uh, I think it's up to 2,000 total of those uh, parameter values that co can go into uh, one of these parameter slots. So the other thing you'll notice is these square bra braces around some of the words. That means those words are optional. So in this case, the user could say, show me memo number three, or show memo two, or show me memo one. So you, you can use these, these features to recognize a, a, against a lot of different phrases and, and uh, make it somewhat more natural sounding. Uh, Rob Chambers sitting in the back here, he's used this extensively to, uh, to do something that's, he sort of emulates natural language in his application. And if you get a chance, talk to him about it. It's a really cool app. It's a lot more involved than this simple app that I've written. And then finally, well, not finally, 
the next thing I want to talk about is feedback. And what will happen is when the, the global speech recognizer recognizes your app name and a command associated with it, it will, it will use text-to-speech to speak back the, the feedback text to the user. To, it's bas basically a notification saying, this is, what, this is what I heard and this is what I'm going to do. And you, you specify that in your VCD file. And then the next thing to note is this navigate element. This is where you specify what page to go to in your application. If this is, works for Silverlight applications, if you have multiple pa pages in your app, then specify the particular page that can handle, handle this command. Again, this is very, a very simple example. I just have one command. But you'll normally have several commands, and you might have, you might have more than one command per page. You more, might have one, one page per command. It, uh, it depends on how you've organized your application. You can also, by the way, put your own query parameters in, in here, and they'll be passed on to your app as well. So I already talked about this phrase list. This is a, the, the, uh, it's basically a parameter list of things of, that you can fill into this slot here. And the, the, app, the user can say one of those things in that slot. So you, mu you might be saying, oh, boy. Not another XML format to learn. Well, first of all, it's pretty simple, right? But the other thing, just, just to let you know, I want to point out that um, we have in Visual Studio, th this, by the way, is the, uh, the VCD file for the, the uh, Magic Memo application that I showed a few minutes ago. But if you... So when you create a new application and you want to create a VCD file to go along with it, it's very easy. You just go up to Project, Add New Item, and we have a template in there for VCD files right here. Click on that, Add, and it has, it'll bring up a, uh, a template with some, that's al already populated with some uh, typical commands, and there are a lot of comments on how to use it and all that kind of stuff. So it's not, th this, this will give you a jump start on creating your VCD file. So that was step one. As I said, there are four steps. Look, let's look at step number two next. Uh, You have to initialize that VCD file from within your application. Generally, you'll do that on first run. It's very simple. We have this static class, voice command service. And all you do is you pass the URI of your, your installed VCD file in the install path to this command, install command sets from file async. I do recommend that you put it inside of a try catch block because that will catch any compile time errors that you haven't caught during development. So uh, it's that, and, and we also have pretty good messages that show up in this, uh, in, in the catch block. When you, uh, error messages that, uh, I believe they even have line numbers of where the error occurred. Is that true, Jay? Good. Jay says yes. <laughs> OK, the third step is, when your application is launched, you'll want to handle that command. You detect the fact that it was launched by voice commands, you find out which command it was, and check for the command and for any parameters that were included as well. And all that information is available to you in the query string that you get when your, command, when your application is launched. There's this static uh, object called navigation context. And the, you, you don't have to go through dig out the parameters yourself from a, from a query string. It's all there. It's all been uh, organized into key value pairs on this query string collection. So the first thing to do is see if it contains a key for a voice command name. If it does, then it was launched by voice commands. And then you, based on the value of that voice command name, the value, by the way, is the name that you gave that command. In fact, why don't we go back there just briefly and take a look at it. In the, notice here I said command name equals show memos. So that, that is going to be the value of the voice command name key. 
right? So here's, here's the, the key, and the value is uh, I've assigned that to this voice command, to this string, and then I'm switching on that value. In this case, it's, it's that name, show memos. And um, the other thing is, remember we had that, we had a parameter in that command, show memo number num, and that was a parameter that could be one of one, two, or three from the list below. You'll get that in the query string as well, so you can, you can use the, the navigation context object to get that value and do the right thing for your application. Again, this is a very simple application. You can think of a lot more sophisticated uses of this. For example, a, a, a music playing application that has a list of favorites or a list of recently, recently played songs. You can, you can parameterize the commands based on that and play and so that the user can say something like, I don't know, play Beethoven's fifth, and it will come up uh, and do the right thing. So the fourth step that you have to, that you need, well, that you may want to <laughs> implement in your application is uh, code to update phrase lists. As I said a minute ago, your phrase list may change over time. And, and in um, the most compelling scenarios, it will change over time. One of the examples I gave was if you have a phone that uses, or an application that uses geolocation to, uh, to determine a set of restaurants in the area that that person might be interested in, you could dy dynamically update your list of, of restaurants uh, and, and recognize against those for the, for the user. So this is, it, again, it's very simple. You use that same uh, static, where's my mouse here? Use that static uh, class object that we provide to get the installed command sets, and uh, and you give give it the name that you have given that command set in the VCD file, and you'll get a, a, a voice command set object, and then you can update phrase lists on that uh, on that object by specifying the name of the phrase list and then giving a string array. Now this. I've used, I've used a static string array here. Of course, most of the time you won't want to do that. You'll want to use uh, dynamic data that's in your application, but this just illustrates the concept. The, as I said a minute ago, your application will be part of the overall speech experience that the user experiences. And we've, we've done that in a couple of ways, so let me show how, some of how that works. When the user holds down the key, the Windows key, and speaks, they can say any, many different things. They can say call, and then the name of a contact in their contact list. They can say search for uh, pizza in Redmond, Washington, and so on. And all of those are part of the overall global speech experience. But your application that's implemented voice commands will also be part of that global speech experience. And as a matter of fact, that, that general example that I mentioned before that's in your voice command definition file, that will sometimes show up here in one of the examples. We'll, we, we scroll through the examples that the voice command enabled applications have given us and we display those to the user. So we highlight your application in that way. The other thing is once, uh, once your application has been launched by voice commands, it will put up this confirmation screen which the user can cancel out of if we made a, make a mistake. As I said before, speech recognition is hard. We sometimes make mistakes. People like to make jokes about it. But uh, we're getting better all the time. Um, so that's the confirmation screen. The other thing is, if, if the user holds down the Windows key and says, what can I say, we, we display this what can I say screen. And it has a list of, of the first party commands, but it also has this apps section uh, which the user can get to by poking on the apps uh, word there at the top, the tab at the top, or by scrolling to the right. And we'll list the applications there that have been voice command enabled. So this is one way that you can have your application highlighted as part of the phone experience. Also, if the, if the user taps on on your application at that point, we'll put up a little help screen for your application, and it'll show all the voice commands 
that your, uh, the examples of the commands that you've given uh, in your voice command definition file. Re you recall there, there were those two sets of kinds of examples, the global example and then the, uh, the command specific example, and those will show up in this second screen there on the right. Okay, so let's do another demo. I'm, this is, again, a very simple application that uh, just sort of illustrates the concept. I keep losing my mouse here. And, um, but it's with this, this voice command, uh, this, excuse me, this uh, magic memo application that I showed early, earlier. I'm not in the application. I've, I've, uh, I want to make sure I'm not. Okay. I'm going to launch the application and give it a command with just one utterance. Magic memo. Show memo number five. Showing memo number five. Check out the new Windows phone devices. And all, all this really did was, oh, I'm <laughs> using my mouse to cancel out of that, sorry. <laughs> It's like the joke about uh, uh, how can you tell when I have to be really careful to be politically correct here. Uh, <laughs> an uninformed person has been using a computer because there's whiteout on the screen, right? <laughs> anyway, um, okay, so that's that. Uh, again, what happened was the, the global speech experience, which listens for all kinds of things, inclu including search and call and text and all the other apps that are voice command enabled, it has um, it recognized that I was saying magic memo, the name of my application, and a command that my application can handle. And so it launched the application at the appropriate page, which was not the main page, it was the view memos page, and it passed the information of what command it was and that parameter which was, was uh, five because I specified voice, uh, show memo number five. Again, very simple uh, application of this concept. Uh, we're always amazed at the, at the ingenuity of our developers, and I'm sure that you will be able to do a lot sexier things with, with this feature than this very simple thing that I've shown here. So now let's go on to... Uh, the, the, the second scenario, which is that in-app speech dialogue. When you, divine, when you, when you, uh, you uh, design developer features, an API for, for, uh, for anyone, there's always this trade-off between making things simple and also providing advanced features. And we think we actually did a pretty good job of doing, uh, meeting both of those requirements because if you use the default values in, for uh, speech recognition and text-to-speech, you'll find that uh, you, can, you can implement both of those features with just a few lines of code, and we'll see that in, the, in a minute. But in addition, we've also provided the advanced features with, by uh, adding uh, support for, for the advanced scenarios. There are two namespaces in uh, the speech dialogue uh, feature. There's the speech, the text-to-speech namespace. Text-to-speech is speech output. Output. So you give text to to a method, and you call that, and and the phone speaks to the user. And you can see all kinds of uh, uh, use cases for this: notification, confirmation, feedback, and also things like a screen reader or a book reader, for example. Um, speaking plain text is very easy. We'll see that an example an example of that in a minute. But in addition. We have the more advanced scenario covered by uh, a speech synthesis markup, which lets you uh, put attributes of that text in a, a markup. And I'll, so, I'll show you uh, a little bit about how that works in a minute. The second thing is uh, speech recognition itself, where the user speech speaks to the phone, and you recognize that. And the two main use cases for that are command and control, and text input. And we, we have three different grammars that we provide for, for that, and we'll talk in quite a bit of detail about what I mean by a grammar, because it's, it's a slightly different concept from what you learned in grade school. <laughs> and then 
The other thing is there's a UI, there's built-in UI that you can use as part of this speech recognition experience. And that also is part of the overall UI. It's integrated in the overall UI of the phone, and it makes your, your application look like it's part of the phone. It's not, again, not some foreign object. So let's look at speech synthesis, speaking text to the user in just two lines of code. Very simple. You instantiate a, spe a speech synthesizer object, and you call speak text async with your text on that object. And it'll, uh, the phone will say, you have a meeting with Peter in 15 minutes. Actually, it's mu much worse than that. <laughs> it's getting better all the time. That's another thing. Speech synthesis is also hard. But it, it it's doesn't, I don't know if, how many of you listened to speech synthesis 10 years ago? It sounded really tinny, didn't it? We're getting a lot better than that, I have to say. We have a team in Beijing that does this, and they're, they've really done a good job on this, uh, the natural natural sounding voices. So the other thing is I mentioned that's the easy way to do it for the more advanced features. We have something called SSML speech synthesis markup language. It's a W3C standard and you can you can using that markup language you can specify things like volume and pitch and even the voice that you want to use. You can put uh, bookmarks, embed bookmarks in the text to be spoken and then you can handle the bookmark event and, and uh, do, do something based on that. So for example, you can use that uh, bookmark event and SSML to highlight text as it's spoken. You might have a sentence and you, and you highlight each word as they're being spoken using that bookmark reached event. And also there's an API for, you, for your code to select which voice it wants to use. The phones come with most phones come with two voices, a male, a male voice and a female voice, but there also are going to be voices that can be downloaded for other languages and for, with other features. Uh, there might be a Darth Vader voice, for example. Actually, I made that up. I don't think there is going to be. But uh, uh, it would be cool if there were. Uh, Luke, use the force. Oh, that's, that's the other guy, isn't it? <laughs> so... Um, and you, you can select which voice you want to use uh, using that API. So that's text-to-speech, speech output. Now let's talk about speech recognition, speech input, input, where the user is speaking to the phone and you take action based on, on what the user is saying. First of all, we have three grammar formats, as I mentioned, and I'm going to talk about those in a little bit of detail and, and the different uses that, that they have. And we have a couple of events. There's, there's the event for audio problem occurred. You'll want to handle this in most cases because you can give feedback to the user if they're speaking too slowly or if there's too much noise in the ambient noise for you to recognize very well, or if they're speaking too, too loudly, for example. There's a handful of, event, of uh, values that, this, that come back on this event. And also, if you roll your own UI, which we'll talk about in a minute, you'll want to uh, capture or handle the speech audio capture state changed event. Big long name uh, for a simple concept. It's basically this tells when when the phone has stopped listening and is starting to process and and vice versa. So more features. Uh, you can customize the UI. We'll see an example of that. You can specify the example text and the listening text, listen, listen text. And when you when the speech recognition is completed, you'll get a result object back. And that'll have, that has a lot of stuff on it. Uh, the most obvious thing is the text that was recognized. Sometimes, if you use semantics, you don't really care about the text that was recognized. You, you care about the, the semantic values, and you take action based on that. So semantics is there as well. There's a confidence value. And there's also a big, long list of, well, sometimes, a big, long list of alternates that you can look over if, you don't, if you're not sure that that top alternate is, is the right one. Again, that, that's an advanced scenario. I don't recommend it in most cases. Most of the time, that top alternate is going to be the right one. So now let's look at, again, the simple case for speech recognition. Three lines of code. You instantiate your speech recognizer. You await the speech, the, the recognize async event. Get a, get a result back from that, and then you do something with it. 
Now, those of you that are experienced developers, and I'm sure that's most people here, know that it's not never as simple as this, right? <laughs> But this is the core of what you do. You'll want to have a try catch block around that, and, you'll, and generally, you'll, after you get the result back, you'll want to check for successful recognition. And in this case, since it's not the UI, I'm not using the speech recognizer with built-in UI, you'll probably want to do something based on that speech capture state changed event to notify the user that he or she should stop talking. So, but, but the core of what you do is these three things. I'll, I'll, another thing I want to dwell on a little bit here is you'll notice it says, th this second one uh, line says, the comment is, use the default short message dictation grammar. This is important. We're going to talk about grammars in quite a bit of detail in a minute. If you don't specify a grammar, you get the, di the dictation grammar. The dictation grammar is basically it's a large search space. Um, it means that the user can say almost anything. And we, so that requires that the processing take place uh, it, with our speech service in the cloud. But there are other grammars that you can specify that are done locally using the local speech recognition engine on the phone itself. And we'll, we'll go into quite a bit of detail about that. So here we are, speech grammars. A grammar, just, just as with in linguistics, a grammar in speech recognition is basically a set of rules that, are, that the speech recognition engine is going to listen for. It's basically a way to constrain the, the, things, the, the things that the user can say. And we do that for a couple of reasons. If, if we don't constrain those, the words that the user can say, then the speech recognition engine has to search over this vast infinity of, of word combinations, and accuracy goes to hell in a handbasket. Accuracy and latency. And so there are a couple different ways that we constrain the, 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 the words that we create grammars, and, and I'll show some examples of these. And the, we have two grammars that are predefined. Well, why don't I just go to the next slide? I believe it's on that. Yeah. Uh, there are two predefined grammars. There's the short message di dictation grammar, which is the default, and there's the web search grammar. The short, short message dictation grammar is the same one that's used by the texting application that we saw at the very beginning of the presentation. The web search grammar is the same one that's used by the search, the search keyword. If you tap on your key and say, if you say anything without search, for example, if you just say weather in Chicago, for example, it will use the search grammar to recognize that. It goes off to our service in the cloud and uh, does the recognition there. But you can use these grammars in your application as well. They're very easy to use. They're complex grammars, but, but we take care of that. We've already defined the grammar. You, for, for you, if you use the short message dictation grammar, you just go ahead. You don't specify anything. You just use the default. If you want to switch to the, the uh, web search grammar, it's just this one line of code that you put before the recognize async call. You specify the grammar name and, and this uh, enum with web search as the value. So it's very easy to use these grammars. And by the way, we're looking to the future for Windows Phone something, <laughs> eight point something. I, 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 should, I don't know the name. No one knows the name. <laughs> But uh, if you have feedback on the kinds of, of uh, predefined grammars you would like, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. There are lots of other ideas for, for a predefined grammars. They didn't, wouldn't necessarily have to be remote. For example, uh, things like numbers and addresses and currency and that kind of thing. Predefined grammars for them would be nice, we think. So let us know what you think about that. The other two types of, types of grammar are custom grammars. These are grammars that you define. And these both take place on the phone itself, the local speech recognizer. I think we're the, I'm not sure, but I think Windows Phone 8 is the only phone that has, local, has, a, has an API for local recognition. I might be wrong about that. Correct me if I'm wrong. But you, you get to specify the set of words and the, and the combinations of words that the speech recognition engine listens for. The simplest way to do that is with a simple list. And basically, you just say, 
Here are the set of phrases I want to recognize, recognize against. Uh, that, that works well for something like a yes-no grammar, for example. But what if, instead of just yes and no, you want to listen to yeah, for anything that sounds that's remotely like yes and, and no. So yes, yup, uh-huh, affirmative, make it so, uh, etc. And then for no, nope, no way, etc. All those things translate into the same thing, right? And you don't want to parse the, the uh, recognition text and check for each one of those values. So one way to get around that is to use something called semantics. You can, within a, what's called uh, an SRGS grammar, speech recognition grammar specification, which is a W3C format of grammar, you can specify semantics. And what that means is you can assign a semantic with a recognition value. And then you can just test against one semantic. So you could map all of the different ways to say yes into into one, one uh, semantic value, affirmative, for example, and just test for that semantic value. And that greatly simplifies processing. It also has the advantage that you can use different grammars with, for different languages, one for German, one for French, one for Japanese, Chinese, and so on, and always use the same code behind because you're just coding off of, of semantics. You're not coding off the actual text that was recognized. So that's one advantage of uh, of the semantics feature is one advantage of uh, SRGS grammars. Another is that you can specify rules and you can have rule references. You can have your grammar file that references other rules within the file or other files that you can bring in. So you can have predefined or your own predefined grammars that you have defined that you use a lot and you can just uh, reference those from some other from within some other grammar. Lots of other things you can do with SRGS. It's kind of the advanced case. That means you have to author a grammar and test it and debug it, and there's, there's a certain amount of, of uh, work required for that. But it has, again, the, the advantage of, of uh, these added features. So those are the two ways you can specify a grammar within your application, a, a, a custom grammar. And both of these, again, are used locally in, in the phone with the local speech recognition engine. So here's an example of that. This is with uh, using an SRGS grammar. Uh, I've in instantiate the speech recognizer UI object. I set the, the text to display to the user in that UI, the listen text and the example text. And then I just uh, add grammar from UI on, that, on the URI to that file, which is in my install path. And then the next thing I want to, to take a look at is this uh, method, preload grammars async. This is optional, but we re recommend that most applications use it. What happens, the reason this is, this is often necessary, or a good idea anyway, is when you call one of these add grammars uh, methods, there, there are three of them, add grammar from predefined type, add grammar from list, and add grammar from URI. When you call one of those three, it, the grammar itself isn't compiled. We don't parse and compile the grammar at that time. We put it in a, in a list or in a queue to be uh, processed later. When you call, if, if you don't call preload grammar async, the first time you call recognize with UI async, it's going to do all that processing. It's going to parse and compile the grammar and put that and add it to whatever other grammars it already has on that object. In, in some cases, if, especially if, if you have a large uh, SRGS grammar, that can take quite a bit of time. It can take on the order of seconds, for example. If you have a list of city names, you know, 500 cities across uh, the U.S. Or, or the world, then that, that could take some time. So we recommend that you call preload grammar async because that, what that does is it pre-processes that. It populates the, the grammar structure before the call to recognize with UI async. And then again, in this case, I have shown that you, how to test for a successful recognition. And if you're successful, then you go ahead and do whatever you want to do with that result. This, by the way, is approximately the same as the code that's in the uh, Magic Memo application. I have a grammar there that has semantics 
and for uh, commanding the, that second page, that view memos page, and it shows how you can, how you can uh, use semantics and also rule references. It's kind of, again, simple, but it kind of illustrates the concept. So this, we're getting close to the end, but I do want to sort of in summary show the overall object model of, uh, of this, the speech recognition UI namespace. You'll notice that there are two objects called speech recognizer. There's speech recognizer UI, and then there's one that's a child of that speech recognizer object itself. This is actually sort of the, the business end. This is where the recognition itself actually happens. If, you're, if your application is, uh, wants to roll its own UI, you're a game, for example, or you have some specialized UI, then you'll want to use this, this object. Then you'll call uh, preload grammar async and, and uh, recognize async on, this, on that object. However, in most cases, we recommend that people use this object, the speech recognizer UI object, because that, again, it integrates UI with the overall experience of the phone, and it makes your app look, look like it's a part of the phone. It's, it's integrated into the phone experience. This speech recognizer UI object has a speech recognizer object on it, as I said. It also has that UI settings object, which we saw a minute ago, a few other things. You'll want to, by the way, you'll want to call recognize with UI a async on the parent object there to do the recognition. That's what makes, it does make sure the recognition happens, but also it puts up UI. If you call the version of that that's down here, recognize async on this uh, recognizer object without UI, then you won't get the UI. So I, I hope that's clear from, just from the names of the methods, which ones you should call. The grammars collection sits on the speech recognizer object, and that's where you add grammars. So you, the, you, those three calls, three ways to add grammars, are methods that sit on that collection. And it's a collection that's indexed over the name that you gave, gave that grammar when you call, called uh, add, the add grammar method. And there's a settings object there as well. So here's a look at the the built-in speech recognition UI. Uh, when when you, uh, you're the user, in this case, it's from that Magic Memo application that I mentioned earlier. When the user taps on the mic button, the, the UI that, that's provided by, by the system, you don't have to do this yourself, it's provided by the system, that scrolls down and obscures the top of the application, and it displays those two strings that you put uh, the listen text and the example text. This is the listen text, which defaults, by the way, to listening dot, dot, dot. If you don't put anything, it'll just say listening. And that's, that's fine for lots of applications. And then the example text will show up there as well. And, uh, and the user can speak at that point. They can, they can all, if they're finished before the app thinks that they are, they can tap the go button to say, uh, basically to say I'm finished. So, so, that's basically it. I would love to see some really cool apps out there that are speech enabled. I know you can do it. As I said, we've been always, we're always amazed at the ingenuity of our application developers, the kinds of things that they come up with. And, uh, you know, so have at it. You know, Oh, by the way, one thing I should bring up, there's a, uh, there, here are some places you can go for, uh, for more information on this. Uh, there's an online help file. Sorry that this is such a long, ugly URI, but uh, I believe you're going to get copies of these slides and you'll be able to, to or you can just search, search on uh, Windows Phone Speech API and you'll, that'll come up. Also, I've written a, a, a magazine article for MSDN and if you go to, uh, to this URI, you can see it's actually in the November and December issues. In the November, there will be uh, it, the November issue, which is already out, is about uh, voice commands. The December issue is going to be about that in spe speech dialogue, text to speech, and speech recognition. So, um, there's, okay. So, let's take questions. Yes, sir.
So the, by the way, if you can, if you could go to the microphones, I can repeat your question though uh, for this one. Um, the, the question is, there's a limit on the number of parameters you can have in your parameter list, and what if you happen to have, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of parameters, right? And it's, it exceeds the limit. There are a couple of ways you can handle that. One thing Rob, uh, Rob Chambers' app does is it, it um, lets you, it basically says get into the application itself, and then it uses a private, a, a custom grammar that you've used. Uh, it's, it's kind of a workaround, but it does work pretty smoothly in his app anyway. Um, there's also, by the way, a wildcard uh, feature in voice commands. So you, in that curly braces, if you put an asterisk, it'll match anything. Unfortunately, you don't see whatever that any, anything is in your application because that would require a dictation grammar, and, and we can't do that locally on the phone. But you, you, can, you, can, you can recognize against that, and then you can, you know, you can say play asterisk and, and have that be one of the options. And then within the application, you can say, gee, they said play, and I have you know, 10,000 titles. I'm going to ask, I'm going to do a, a further recognition within my application against my custom grammar that has those 10,000 titles, because there's not a limit in your custom grammars on the on parameters like that. Yes, sir. Uh, I th Hello. Okay. Yes, good. So I think you just answered my question. So it was the same that can I do something like the note built in app, so saying note and then a custom text after that. Yeah. So that's how I, that's how I do it. So I do get the waveform then? You I don't get the waveform, yeah. Uh, unfortunately we 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 weren't able to get that into Windows Phone eight. But what happens is, again, it matches what the, what the user said, and you, get, you are informed of the fact that there was something that wasn't recognized, yes. but you don't get the waveform and you don't get the, uh, uh, you don't get the recognized text for that. You just get the fact that it used one of these uh, universal rules. Called, it's actually called a garbage rule, believe it or not. So after that, I will have to do another speech recognition uh, session, basically. Right. And, and if you do it with a custom grammar using an SRGS, you can do all kinds of cool things. So get them into your application and then do a... You, by the way, if you noticed in the Magic Memo app, uh, app it, when it was launched by voice commands to enter a new memo, it immediately started recognizing within the application just like the text application does. So you can do that as well. It's, it, and in that way, it's a little more seamless. They don't have to tap on a microphone or anything. They, you can just start recognizing immediately within your application. Yeah, but they still have to wait for the application to launch, which is fast, but still not immediate. Yeah, You're right. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, so you showed, uh, you showed with the parse grammar async the notion of pre-parsing the grammar so you don't have to keep eating that every time the user launches the application and so on. Right. I'm curious, is there any notion for really complex grammars um, of actually persisting the already parsed grammar objects so that I could perhaps trade off space on disk for load time? Because I'm going to have to re-parse that grammar every time the user reboots the phone, relaunches the app for the first time the way I see this working. So I'm thinking if the grammar is static, which it probably is, right, mm -hmm. especially in more complex situations, it would make more sense to potentially eat that parsing cost once and then persist right. the parsed results somewhere and just reuse those rather than every time I relaunch the app. Yeah, is there you, any notion of that coming down the pipeline? You'd like to serialize the... Yeah, I'd like to serialize the parsed result. That's, that's a great requirement. We did think about that, uh, but we weren't, weren't able to include it due to schedule and so on. But, but you're thinking in that direction. Yes, that's very good feedback. Okay. And uh, we'll, we'll certainly take that into account. In fact, why don't you give me a card afterwards? Yeah, and sure, I, I'd be glad to. And I can use that as ammunition. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, if, some, if you specify more than one language uh, in your grammar, how does the phone decide which one to use? Is a person limited to uh, whichever grammar happens to match the regional settings? Or if a person knows more than one language, can they arbitrarily you know, switch between using one or the other? How does that work out? That's a very good question. The way it works with voice commands is, uh, again, that's, voice commands is the, the feature that you, that you use when <clears throat> uh, to launch the application. That only works with the language of the overall global recognizer. So whatever the user has set in the settings. 
and, and if they go to settings and tap on uh, speech, they can specify what language they want to use for their global recognition. However, in your application, there's a, there's a way you can go, you can find out what speech recognition languages are supported, and you can specify, in my app, I want to use this language. So that's something that you could use for like a, a language teaching application or a translation application or some, something like that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. You mentioned the possibility of um, additional um, speech synthesis uh, voices. I was wondering, are those going to be options that third parties can provide, or are those only going to be first party, you know, like OS updates? Uh, Jay or Rob, do you guys know the answer? There, there are 30 voices, so there's 15 languages on the device that a user can choose to download and install. And as a developer, we'll, we'll just be able to enumerate and figure out which ones are there. Right, but his question is whether. Okay. Well, regarding localization, mm, could yes. you use a ResX file for other languages? I'm mean, just thinking of the easiest ways to bring in a lot of words for, uh, you know, if I have support in different languages. You could certainly uh, do that. Well, yeah, there are a couple of ways you could do that. One, for for your uh, a list grammar, that would be the best way to do it is to use a uh, a ResX file and and read in the strings from the the resource file and populate the the string array and, and uh, add that as a grammar. For an SRGS grammar, you'll probably just want to have a different file for each language. And uh, for one thing, it has the XML lang uh, property uh, on, on the header. And, and we, by the way, we check to see that the XML lang ta value matches the same as the current, uh, the language of the current speech recognition uh, engine. So. That's the way that you'd want to localize it in that case. Yes, sir. Uh, is there any plans for Windows 8 integration or any Windows 8 APIs? Um, it was a beautiful sunrise this morning, wasn't it? I'll just say that's, uh, that's uh, something that's in planning. I'm, I'm told I'm not, to, I'm not supposed to say anything about Windows 8, so I don't know. Sorry. Thank you. Sure. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Hi. I have two quick questions. Okay. The first one has to do with games. You mentioned something about that. Is it possible to use the object and uh, recognize speech while the gameplay is not interrupted? So hold down a button, say something, release the button, and this be recognized asynchronously while the game is still playing? I think you're talking about continuous recognition. Yes. Uh, the way speech recognition works officially on the phone is that it's a one-shot. The user, uh, you know, you, you in initiate recognition and uh, it, um, you get a, you know, it listens for a while and you get a result back. However, there's a way you can, you can emulate continuous recognition by, in your recognition handler, you can, you, you know, so the, the, speech the speech recognition or recognizer object itself instantiates the iAsync operation interface, and that has uh, a completed handler on it. And you can, in your completed handler, you can, which means you know, that, would, that gets called when the speech recognition completes, inside of that handler, you can launch a new instance of the recognizer. So you can emulate continuous recognition in that way by just every time you get a result, you know, launch, uh, launch a new uh, recognition session. It's, it doesn't work completely because sometimes you'll lose a little audio, but it sort of works. It, it actually works quite well. We've tested it and it works quite well. We are thinking about continuous recognition in the future, though, so it's good to get your feedback that you'd like to have that. So what's your next question? The next question has to do with, uh, does the OS actually prevent an app from hijacking another app's uh, commands? I mean, if, if I can define the apps in the XML, then what, what's stopping me from using another app's same commands, exactly the same? Not talking about the OS built-in commands that you mm -hmm. mentioned. Uh, you could do that, yes. Why would you, why would you want to? <laughs> <laughs> 
I wouldn't want to. <laughs> just asking if there's a way to, to prevent Well, this. we do. First of all, uh, there are already in the marketplace lots of apps that have the same name. So having the same, the same name is a problem. Uh, however, most apps are going to have different commands, right? And when we, so if you happen to have two apps that have the same name, they're likely to have different, different commands. And so when, uh, when the user taps and says a, uh, uh, an app name and a command, we recognize the whole phrase. We don't first recognize the app and then based on that decide what command. We recognize against the whole phrase. And so you're, you're likely to get the right app and the right command. However, if there's some malicious app that does something like that, that attempts to hijack some other app, we, we're going to be monitoring that, I'll say. And we don't, there's no way that we can act, absolutely prevent one app from doing that. But we're go going to be watching it. And Jay has some more comment on this, but let me just finish. And we're going to, we're going to uh, if there are problem apps like that, we'll, we'll uh, take action. Yes, Jay. Oh, that's a good point, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was wondering, is there any way to recognize against uh, building resources on the device, like the contacts list or the appointments of, of the calendar? That's a very good question. I'm sorry to say that in Windows Phone 8, the answer is no. However, give me your card, and I can use that as am ammunition for some, a, future, <laughs> a future feature, because we, it is something we would like to have. So. Yes, sir. Can we do deferred recognition against a WAV file? You cannot in Windows 8. Uh, that's a very good question, another good question, another good feature request. So please give me your card. And <laughs> it is something we wanted to do, but again, because of schedule, we weren't able to provide that in Windows Phone 8. So. Other questions? Thank you, everyone. I hope